Hello everyone, welcome to the whiteboard. We're going to spend a few minutes and just cover a couple of pointers on DNS records today. I'm not gonna to try to catch all of them. There is actually quite a number of DNS records, but we're gonna focus on about 10 of them that you're going to see on a regular and common basis. So if you're a beginner in this industry, you're gonna to want to get to know these 10 records and know them by heart so then you see them, you understand their assignment and how they can play a role and impact you as a cybersecurity professional. And probably one of the first records that people will notice is the A record, also known as the address mapping record. Uh, this is your DNS host record. It stores the host name and its corresponding IPv4 address. Uh, when you have an IPv6 address, it changes from this A record, this address mapping record, to a completely different kind, a quad A or IP version 6 address record which effectively is the same thing. So if this is filled in, you have an IPv6 IP. If the A record is filled in, you have an IPv4. So they're pretty straightforward, but they're two things and you may have them both filled in. It is quite possible to have both a IPv4 IP address assigned and an IPv6 IP address assigned. So they're kind of important. And when people say, hey, this domain's on this IP, they're making a reference to one of these two records. I'm gonna erase these as we go just to make this simple. Another one that is uh, very commonly ran into that people tend to not quite understand is the C name or the C name record. I'm gonna butcher this name, but that's canonical record or canonical name record in this case. That's to give the domain, or sorry, that's to give a, a host name another host name. I know that sounds kind of confusing, so you could have my domain dot com and you may want a C name for it and you may not think about this but actually www is a canonical name or a C name for anything we just think World Wide Web is kind of part of the domain but the reality is it is actually a C name and if I was doing mydomain.com it would be www.mydomain.com and I would have that as a C name entry if I had mail dot my domain dot com I could set it up as well and that and I could have more than one C name field entered it's it's quite fine to have several of them that way if anyone types in either mail or www.mydomain.com they would resolve to the defined a record or quad a record that you have set up it's a great way to handle uh, subdomains of many kinds and point them to different IPs you can also put an asterisk in the C name, which I do not suggest, but that's effectively a wild card. In some cases, it actually is a dollar sign or something similar, and that will make any subdomain act as a C name and redirect to that IP. You'll see that when you do parking pages, for example, or you see uh, suspended pages, things like that. It'll redirect anybody's attempt to put any subdomain, and it'll redirect them to the IP that's assigned. All right. We're gonna get through these and I'll write them all out one more time. I just wanted to make sure and cover these records because they are important. Uh, this MX record is a common record seen as well. That stands for mail exchange. When we talk about email and phishing or whatnot, that's going to be the uh, SNTP email server for that domain. And so a common thing with say, Park Pages for example, is they would have my domain, let's say, is the domain, there may be a C record for, or C name record for a couple of different subdomains, but when it comes to the MX, it may have something completely different. It may have uh, my sketchy mx.com and put a mail subdomain on it. You could have something like that in your record. You could have mail to dot my sketchy. I know you can't read that, but I'm gonna write it out anyway mx.com and so on. You can have actually as many MX records as you want, though generally I believe there's a cap of 10. It's kind of like the name server or the NS record, which I'm gonna talk about next. There's a cap of 10 and a minimum of two. Now with mail servers, you can define one, though some systems will not love you for that and they will force you to try to do two. Now with name servers or NS records, you absolutely have to have two minimum maximum, maximum 10. And the idea here was when the internet was built, 
they wanted, well, when the internet was built and then it's conceived and updated, et cetera, et cetera. As it was going on, they said, hey, you have to have at least two, preferably on different IP ranges and preferably in two different IP areas of the internet. So you'd have one on say uh, 108.x.x.x octet. And this one over here would be in like the 200s because the idea here was you would have redundancy. If one part of the internet was down, the other part would still resolve. We don't really do that these days. We're pretty robust as far as the internet goes. And you can, you'll often see NS1, NS2 as kind of a name server for a website. And they may be pointing at the exact same IP, which not good idea because if that IP goes down or that computer that's behind that IP goes down, it takes down your name servers. Now you can't resolve because one of them, the first one listed tends to be the authoritative one. And that's kind of a different whiteboard lecture that's coming up. But know that you have to have at least two and you can have no more than 10. And that's kind of important. And that NS is a name server record. And its sole job is to specify for that DNS zone, who is the authoritative and who's the delegated kind of servers so that uh, they can get an answer when the domain name system queries to try to find out who needs to resolve a domain name for an IP it knows it can talk to the authoritative name server and it will get it the give it the correct answer. There's another field that you're going to bump into that's really important to know and it's called the reverse lookup pointer record or the PTR. Now I I struggle with this one because sometimes um, I will think of I will note this as RDNS. These are really the same things. Uh, just know that that's the, uh, that's the information that would allow a DNS resolver to provide an IP address and receive a host name back. So when you do a reverse DNS lookup on a website or through terminal or whatever, you're looking for RDNS information. And frequently in Border Gateway Protocol, in the internet side of the house, to route things correctly or to help give hints towards how routing is being done, this RDNS, this pointer record, is used to help... Uh, big systems understand how they've dynamically routed things. It's something that's easily updated. It can be updated quite quickly. It has a great response time for it. And so it can be used to help with routing and often is. On the other hand, just as many uh, websites do not fill out this DNS record and therefore it's empty. It does not have to be filled in. Um, as a contrast to that, so this is a kind of an optional record. A and quad A absolutely have to be filled in. One or the two of them. The C name is optional, but normally seen. So this is also one that's optional, if you will. But this one is mandatory. I'll put an M right here. Uh, the name server, mandatory. You have to have it. The mail server, the mail exchange, optional. And I'll write out a full list here, or I'll publish it at the end of this in the description to make it sense. Uh, so some things are not optional, some things are. A records, absolutely not optional. You have to fill those in. Name server has to be filled in. But RDNS, or the pointer record in this case, the C name, the mail exchange, not mandatory at all. Same thing for another common record that you're going to see called an called a um, SRV. This is another one I have a, a bad localism for. But the SRV is kind of your service location record. So it's kind of used for uh, and with, if you will, the mail exchange, but not completely. Uh, it's basically there for other communication protocols. And that's probably about as far as I want to go. The SRV is used to help define things like it, SPF records, uh, DMARC, DKIM, etc. All these kinds of play into this here as well as some other services to help harden the DNS system, harden email, harden other services that are connected to it. So you often see the SRV um, field a record for DNS filled in, but not not it's an optional one. Unfortunately, it's not a mandatory one, but you'll see it frequently and you can glean a lot of information from it. Uh, same thing for this particular record, SOA, which is kind of an interesting record, is an optional record. You don't always see this one, but this is a statement of authority or start of authority. This appears at the beginning of the DNS zone file, which is the file that contains all these fields and records. And its sole job is to indicate who is the authoritative name server for that current DNS zone as well as some contact details and the serial number and a couple other things. So an SOA is part of the glue that makes a uh, DNS zone file, which is kind of a new term, 
This is what all these fields are in. They're basically a flat file called a DNS zone file. It has these fields, most of which we don't pay attention to. They're actually for the uh, name server and the, um, the uh, DNS server that's taking care of the actual DNS zone. Most of the fields are for them and used by different parts of that system, but we care about a few of these. So it goes back to, you know, the part of the latency in the domain name system is when there's a slowdown in trying to figure out who's authoritative, who's not. And that conflict happens sometimes because there's no SOA record defined. It needs to be defined as much as possible. It helps define um, so many things. And in most cases, it will be there. There will be some default characteristics filled in, even if nothing else is provided. And you'll find a lot of things in here, like how often the record should be refreshed, um, what kind of cadence, um, you know, who to contact, like I had said earlier, and uh, what the authoritative name server is, whether it's the first one, the second one, the third one, and so on. So it's a really, really important location. And I had mentioned DMARC and DKIM and so forth and other kind of protocols, which brings me to the text field. The uh, text record field is kind of a catch-all. You can put anything in there and bad guys have definitely used it or malicious for malicious purposes because it's a text field that you can literally put things in. They've used it from everything from command and control to, to exfil data. And of course, uh, as defenders and as folks interested in cybersecurity, we use it ourselves in different ways, uh, such as to kind of make a note towards encryption, to indicate an SPF record, to indicate um, DKIM, DMARC, and other services, give authentication, basically make things machine readable for the most part. Um, or I guess I should say that differently. Put information in there that's mostly machine readable, but able to help us understand our DNS zone, how we protect it, what services might be engaged, authentications, uh, just a host of things like that. And I promised that I would do 10 fields, so I'm gonna add another one in that I personally don't see that often, but it is, it is equally important and it's a cert field. And so if you use um, PGP or SPKI or any of those other kind of encryption certificates, they'll be here in the certificate piece. And so that's 10 fields, most of which are sadly optional, but very important when they do show up. Your key ones are the name server fields, of course, and the A and the quad A records because they absolutely have to be filled in. You can't function without these. And of course, another key one is the, oops, I almost wrote out text. It's TXT. Don't put an E in there accidentally like I was about to. You know, that and um, the MX, these constitute kind of your most critical fields, especially as a beginner, that you need to have information and knowledge about. And all of these constitute the um, zone file plus a bunch of other things that are kind of important like I said to the software that runs this just remember that this is a mandatory item we're just gonna call it mand mandatory and these can be optional though they're typically filled in as well as some of the other fields that we mentioned and they can be a rich source of information as you're working on and looking at DNS so that's a quick kind of tutorial Though, actually, before I close, it might behoove me to note, when I say zone file, we're talking about that DNS zone file. If you recall how DNS functions in our, in our DNS server here, or if you prefer, I can draw you know, a stack here. On our DNS server, this is where the zone file is. It's all filled in. And its job, once filled out, is when in DNS, as you know, we type in a name, a domain, but the internet actually understands IP addresses because that's how we do assignments. So we'll type in a domain and it will query for it to figure out what IP it needs to go to. Well, who it queries is the name server, the DNS name server. And so it will have one assigned, a DNS resolver really is what we're talking about here. The initial step is with the DNS resolver, which is again a DNS server. It's going to say, hey, I don't know the answer, so I'm gonna go ask root. Root's gonna ask the local. Root's gonna go down its chain until it gets down to basically uh, playing the telephone game of handing off things. 
until it gets to somebody who's authoritative. And that authoritative DNS server is going to be the one that has the zone file. It's going to say, hey, I have the most accurate data. I have the zone file. I am the authority. And it's going to have all this detail. And it's the one that's going to give the answer back to you so that your browser knows what IP to go and actually get the information that you're requesting. So uh, again, thank you for spending time here. It's a short whiteboard kind of introduction to uh, DNS and domain name records. Uh, there's, I'll make a more organized breakdown of this as we go, but this is an important concept. DNS is big and yet small at the same time. You really wanna to try to make sure you get this under your belt as far as where things are, how things work, how they connect. I'll go into detail in each area and try to cover it in micro over the next couple of months so that we can get all that kind of hammered out. So as a beginner, you at least have the connected pieces of DNS and the things you're going to need to succeed in a cybersecurity field. So thank you for your time. If you like this video, please click like. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please take a second to do that because you, you'll find hopefully that this and other uh, shorts like the whiteboards and some of the longer lectures will help you as you further your career. So thank you for your time.